Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here this evening. My colleagues and I are in the middle of one of the most extraordinary periods of discovery and exploration that perhaps has occurred in the search for human origins on the continent. But before I tell you about that and share some of the exciting finds that are going on, I want to take you back a little bit to look at the history of the search for human origins on the continent to place in perspective just what is happening to this science uh, during the period that during the uh, first and second decades of the, of the 21st century. Uh, this is, in fact, the 90th anniversary of the discovery of the Tong Chao. In 1924, Raymond Dart from Vitz University found the first fossil that would be described as an early human ancestor, although it takes several decades to uh, be accepted and that would start the search for humankind's origin, a search that was predicted by Darwin in the origin of species in the continent of Africa. Up until 1948, finds that would occur in South Africa at sites like Sturtfontein and Swartkrons and Cromdry, led by people like Robert Broom as well as Dart and others, would lead the search. All of the attention was focused down here in Southern Africa. But in 1948, the National Party came into power. And perhaps human origins and the evolutionary understanding that we all stemmed from one common ancestor on the continent of Africa was, was perhaps not popular with that sort of political <laughs> ideology at that time. And research funding and research support for the search for human origins in Southern Africa actually began to become quite minimal during, uh, after that into the 1950s. But great things were happening elsewhere. And by the late 1950s, Lewis and Mary Leakey started an explosion of research in Eastern Africa. At sites like Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, they would find other early human ancestor fossils, and they would proclaim that East Africa, in fact, was more likely the source of the origins of humankind. And that would begin to propagate a quite veritable explosion in scientific exploration and discovery through countries in, like Ethiopia, Kenya, and of course also in Tanzania. By the late 1960s, countries in Ethiopia, and particularly Kenya around the Kubifora area, led by uh, their son Richard Leakey, began to uh, give us fossils that were quite extraordinary, not only in their morphologies, but also in their numbers. We were starting to move from dozens of fossils. Until that time, this fossil record of human origins in Africa had been considered one of the rarest records uh, of any fossil family that exists. But in Eastern Africa, you started to see more and more, quite literally hundreds of fossils began to uh, be found in these lake sediments and in these riverine sites where these explorers were finding these fossils. By the early 1970s, Ethiopia began to deliver not just fragments of fossils, but skeletons of fossils, with the first true skeleton of a fossil, the famous Lucy fossil, being discovered by Donald Johansson and his teams in the Hadar of Ethiopia. And by that time, by the middle of the 1970s, moving into the late 1970s, it had basically been firmly established in the minds of many scientists, and perhaps the public at large, that the story of human origins was an east side story. That it was not a story that had occurred here in southern Africa where those first fossils had been found. This was in fact probably a side branch and continued explorations largely in those three countries that I mentioned would lead to more and more fossils being discovered and more and more evidence that would point to the critical events in human origins happening along the eastern Rift Valley up into the north of Africa into the highlands of Ethiopia. And that would give us a story of the origins of bipedalism. The or at back three, even four million years. That would give us the origins of the genus Homo, the expansion of our brain, sometime after two million years. All these critical events that identify us as this remarkable animal out of Africa. By the late 1980s, there was Almost no work going on here in Southern Africa except for being held by a couple of uh, brave researchers, people like the late Professor Philip Tobias and Professor Bob Brain at the Transvaal Museum, who were carrying on research at a couple of core sites, but it did not receive the kind of attention that those East African finds did. By the early 1990s, though, I think as we're all aware, things began to change in Southern Africa. 
the search for human origin began to get support once again, particularly by the middle 1990s, and small discoveries began to get made. Discoveries like the site of Gladysville, which my team and I made back in 1991, which was the first new early hominid site to be discovered in 1948. By the time we reached the late 1990s, smaller sites had yielded more and more fossils, and we began to see bits and pieces coming from some new sites. By the end of the 19, uh, by 1998 itself, we saw the, the discovery and description of the first skeleton that had been discovered truly in Southern Africa, that of Littlefoot. But that came from a site that was very, very well known, a site called Serpentine. And there began to be an idea still pervasive in our field that we've discovered it. That most of the major discoveries had already been made and that this was an ever depleting resource. Still, the East Side story of human origins dominated as we moved into the 21st century with the idea that those critical events were still coming out of East Africa. And the fossils that were coming out of Southern Africa were in part largely sideshows to that, mostly evolutionary extinct dead ends. By, in 2008, um, I discovered the site of Malapa, and on the second visit, my then nine-year-old son, Matthew, discovered the first piece of a hominid that would launch the Malapa project, one of the largest projects uh, in the paleosciences that had ever been launched. Today, with over 125 scientists and researchers from around the world examining the remarkable fossils from this site just outside of Johannesburg in the cradle of human kind. From that site would come a number of skeletons, a rich fossil deposit, making that little tiny site that we've discovered one of the richest early hominid sites in the world. Almost unprecedented levels of preservation and discovery. We would name a new species, Australopithecus sediba. And that research and project would launch sort of the idea that there was more to discover out there. Because it's important to remember that this area outside of Johannesburg had been searched almost continuously since 1935. And yet here in the middle of it, right next to some of the major sites, was not only just another site, but perhaps one of the richest that had ever been discovered. We spent the last five years publishing that in a number of scientific articles and doing research on these remarkable specimens. But I think in the back of our minds, we did think that we had sort of hit the jackpot, that that was going to be perhaps the biggest find that we would ever make. That is, until last year. In October of last year, my teams were out in the field exploring, and I brought me some photographs of a remarkable series of fossils. The fossils were found in a site right under our nose, less than a kilometer away from the site of Swartkrons that had been worked since 1948, and just over a kilometer away from the site of Sturkentain, the oldest continuous dig in the history of paleoanthropology on the continent. And in that photograph were remarkable fossils. That launched an expedition, which we launched in November with the help of amateur caver societies, as well as these becoming professional teams as well as explorers from around the world who joined us. And in a short period of 16 days underground in November, in what was then called the Rising Star Expedition, we recovered the largest assemblage of early human ancestor fossils ever discovered in history. 16 days, we discovered 1,200 early human ancestor remains. And to place that in perspective, that is more than more homin hominid fossils, more human ancestor fossils, than been, di been discovered in the last 90 years in South Africa. Our teams are underground right now, literally today. I just came out of the ground um, this morning, where we're pulling out more fossils from this remarkable deposit, and there are more discoveries to be made. We've discovered other fossil sites like this. And the reason we've done that is because we got back out in the field and began exploring again. And that's the message that I want to leave the audience with tonight. We thought, we were a field that by the early 21st century thought it had discovered everything. We thought that there were no new finds to be made. We were a field that sought perhaps the rarest sought after objects on the planet and had convinced ourselves of their rarity and thus that we wouldn't find them. And so I would dare say that some of us stopped looking. The fact of the matter is, though, that they are out there. That we have a record in Africa of human origins that's unrivaled. 
that here in Southern Africa, we have a record now that's unprecedented, perhaps in archeology, span paleontology, and paleoanthropology. And our teams are fast making these once rarest sought after objects on Earth, the not so rarest sought after objects on Earth. And that's something that I hope everyone hears, particularly young people, because I think there is a tendency in the community, particularly children, to think that all the great discoveries have been made. That the great ages of exploration were 100, 200, 300 years ago and were done by sailing ships and people who would land on lands that they thought might be unoccupied but weren't and claim them and find new things. And that every mountain had been climbed and every great thing had been found. But that simply is not true. And actually the search for human origins here in Southern Africa uh, run out of this university by some amazing people is showing that we have not seen this planet. We have not found everything. Because right under our noses are great things to be found. The site of Malapa was so easy to find that a nine-year-old could do it. <laughs> These new sites like Rising Star are sitting directly under the most explored cave sites and fossil sites in the history of this science, lying right on the surface and all it needed was a photograph and brave people to go and look for. We are going to enter a new age of exploration. And that age of exploration is going to be led by developing world countries like South Africa, countries in Africa, Asia, China, who have these resources and can lead this sort of adventurous <coughs> exploration. As I end, though, I just want to uh, note for most of the audience here and the audience on the radio that there's some extraordinary people in this room that I want to point out. Some of those very explorers, the ones who actually made the discovery, two of them are in this room, Steve and Rick in the audience, as well as some of the remarkable young women who led the expeditions to recover those fossils back in November, what I would call underground astronauts, Marina and Beckham. I'd like them to stand as well as the other members of the scientific team just for a moment, because these people risked their lives to find the the heroes of the next generation of exploration, delivering to us this extraordinary story about where we come from. Thank you.